How many people were at Phil Smith's master class? Great, okay. What, was it inspiring or not? Yes, inspiring. A lot, of, a lot of parts about it, you know, every part of it was, you know, uh, especially the, you notice he didn't mention anything complex at all? Nothing you couldn't understand in daily practice? That's so important. You know, I, I used to think about where my lip was, you know, and like, you know, where the, where the mouthpiece was, you know, and stuff like that. But when it comes down to it, you, I mean, you have to really reduce things to a very simple, sim simple process. Otherwise, d days are not fun. I'm going to, I'll play a little bit and just hopefully this will work. Thank you. So, thanks. So, w what was that? What, what did you experience? Somebody, you know, I don't really teach anything at all. I really ask questions. You know, and when you go to, when you go to your lesson, we're going to talk about practicing, we're going to talk about learning, we're going to talk about studying. I, I studied all during Phil Smith's master class. I'm trying to think about how those things relate to me personally. What can I do to get better? Even at 67 years old, you can always get better. You know, so, so be thinking about that. So what did you experience? Somebody said music. Yes, yes, music is, is right. But there, what, music is, you know, it's kind of a, that's a, a, a generic term, but it, 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 there's something about music that we all can understand. We don't go to lectures before the concerts, do we? To explain to us what the music is all about. Or go to have to take a, a, an applied music class or a history lesson about the composer. We don't, you don't really need to do that. I mean, you have to know. You have to under, so what are, you, what are we experiencing? The pure E word. Emotion. Yeah, there's an emotional connection between the sounds we make on our trumpets and, and other instruments, and people who inhabit the earth and walk around and, and do things. And was there any harmony to this music? 
Not really. There was, there was, what are the, the three elements of music? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, now, it's too complex for Vince. Uh, that means I have to know stuff. Uh, and Vince doesn't know anything. Okay? It's the music gets more excited, the music gets less excited, or it stays about the same. That's where I start. Okay? And so if I'm playing in a group, if the group's getting more intense, I find something that I can do with my emotional trumpet playing, hopefully, that's going to add to that. And of course, then it's what? It's perfect. Because you're, you're, you're making the balance. How many, how many people, and you can, you can close your eyes and raise your hands if you want, how many people go, well, you know, we played this concert and the room was really bad. It was too dead. It was too bright. You know, wasn't enough light. There wasn't this. There wasn't that. If, if you listen, everything that you need to know about a piece is in the piece. It's there to discover. That's the great beauty of being a performer of music. There's somebody's written a play, and inside that play, you're a character. And so we have to be really flexible as far as we have to be able to, to be a different Hamlet or to be, you know, another you know, particular character that you know from some story or something. And then we have to find a way to depict that in our music. So that's where I start. I, I start at a very simple place that has nothing to do with tonguing and slurring and loud and soft and playing in tune and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not discounting those things. They are very important. But uh, like Phil was talking about auditions, and, and I, I go even a step further than, than what he's saying. Um, how many people, you know, they prepare for auditions. How many people show up, usually in a big audition, uh, maybe a hundred, even a few more than that. Let's say a hundred. Now out of those hundred, let's say that 50% of them play in tune, in time, right? They have the right style. They do all these things that everybody, you know, says. And uh, so 50 of them are, half of them are gone already, right? Yeah, so now we got 50 left. And then uh, maybe some people are not as accurate. They do all those things. So maybe we lose another 25 or 30 or, or more for accuracy. OK? So what's left to judge? You have all these people that play in tune, in time, you know, have a, a fairly good sound, uh, you know, good musicians, really. Some of them are excellent musicians, OK? Matter of fact, some of the most excellent musicians got eliminated in the first 50. Maybe even the best musicians got eliminated in the first 50. Now you know, you think that this guy is really crazy. Okay? But what, are, what is the conductor looking for? Are they looking for this? Oh my God. We played Mahler five, six times this week in rehearsal and this trumpet player hasn't gotten it once. The conductor's a wreck already, because you have to start. So, so basically, they're, they're looking for some person who everything they play sounds effortless from the musical instrument. That's, that's not a musical instrument. That is a mechanical device, like a car, okay? And, uh, you know, some people, like Bob Malone, have, have a uh, nice Porsche, you know? And that car goes, it's a beautiful car. I've seen it, I've heard it. It, it sounds fantastic, you know? Just, you just listen to it. It doesn't have to drive down the road. Just go, <laughs> beautiful sound. But without a good driver, that car ain't going anywhere. You know, it's, it's not gonna win any races. You have to have a great musical instrument. This is a musical instrument. You have to get the, musical, the, the mechanical device to sound like the musical instrument, which is this. So that implies a lot of things, right? There has to be something in the musical instrument. Knowledge, understanding. We study music history, music theory. That's when we do study. 
the musician side, not the audience side, the musician side. We study this music, you know, the, the musical styles and, and things. And once again, you know, I think a really sensitive person, you don't have to go to the library every day. You can just listen to things that are around you. And in, you know, talk, people talk about nature and all that. There's beautiful music all over the place. There's, you know, looking at something is art. Looking at art is beautiful and, you know, going to a play and, and getting emotionally involved in, a, in, in the situations and things. And that's what you are in rehearsal. Now, one of the things I might mention is that uh, even at a competition like this, uh, most people that compete don't feel very relaxed, right? Yeah. Well, why do you think that is? It, it, probably not lack of preparation, right? Everybody's been sitting there doing those things that it takes to do. Well, let's look at it this way. You're in the dark and you're walking to your house, right? You take a key out of your pocket, right? And you don't go, oh my God, I hope I get the key in the right place. <laughs> what if I miss? What if I don't get it in the keyhole? I mean, but you think about your experience. You never do that. Why? How many times have you done this? You walk up to the door, you open the screen door, you kick it open with this, and you have your case in this hand, and you stick the key in, and once in a while, you don't get it on the first try, right? Once in a while. So basically, the experience of doing it many, many times. Now, I try to perform at least one solo a week. At least, I said. So, um, when do you think I played that solo last? That particular one. That was, by the way, that was the first movement of uh, this piece, which I love. It's called Four Miniatures. It's by, it's by Edward Hoffman, who used to play uh, assistant principal and third trumpet in the Baltimore Symphony for many years. A very fine composer, too. He's written other pieces, so check him out, Edward Hoffman. It's, it's actually recorded the first time on a Dave Hickman record, one of his very first ones that was on Tromba, Tromba Records that uh, uh, Jerry Ensley had, uh, we, we, to, we were sorry to lose Jerry this year, he passed away, but he was one of the early persons to dem disse disseminate information about trumpet and s print solos and make mouthpieces and, oh, he did everything. He was a super, super cool guy. But, you know, it's, did, did you like the solo? Because you didn't, it, and it was atonal, really. And so you liked it because it was emotional. So the main ingredient of all music, of all auditions, of all recitals is music, is emotion in music. Not just the music, not just playing in time with the accompanist. You know, I played, I used to, you know, when I was a student, uh, I mean, I was obsessed, of course, like all of us are. I was just completely you know, nth degree crazy about practicing and playing, and of course, and that completely made me, what, ineffective into practice. I mean, I was completely, you know, out to lunch. And uh, so, you know, I just would work so hard, and I was missing the whole point, always, you know. I was, play, you know, trying to get everything together. So I decided that I was gonna play only, I, I was gonna play things perfectly. You know, I wasn't going to miss any notes. I was going to be right in time with the accompanists, and I was going to do all these things, you know, and, and my tone was going to be even, and uh, my endurance, you know, and no endurance problems, nothing. So I really, really worked hard, and then, uh, and I practiced, and I, I, I think I was playing like something like the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, you know? And, uh, you know, of course, I'm, oh, I'm ready. And I play the thing, and, and I don't miss anything in the whole thing, you know? I said, wow, I can't wait to hear the tape of that, man. I just can't wait to hear it. And I put the tape on, it was like, da, 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 get it perfect now. Don't miss a note. Make sure it's in tune. 
It was nothing happening. It wasn't me. It was like, who is that person playing? That is awful. That's like the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. And from that day on, I forgot about all that. I said, that's not the way to play music, so I'm not doing that anymore. I'm just going to try to be me, emotional self that I am, you know. And uh, I, think, I think that's a good thing, advice. Now, talk, let's talk about practicing, you know, practicing a little bit. Did anybody have any questions about that? So, so we heard, like, you know, uh, the, we heard the band last night, right? Oh, my gosh, that was a pretty big sound, wasn't it? It was great. And, and Rex sounded fantastic. There he is, Rex. He's still alive. He's played 10 concertos probably this week. Trust me. This guy, and he put it in six different countries. And, uh, you know, and preparation. So, you know, how does, how does Rex, how does he deal with that? I mean, he, he might have played the Haydn, uh, and then he went somewhere else and he played Rex Stream, which I will never play. And... Uh, <laughs> And then he played this new, Tony's new piece t today. And then tomorrow he'll fly somewhere and play some other pieces. So how does he practice all this stuff? Well, he, he practices some. He practices some. I, I, I haven't talked to him about this, so I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. He can, he can uh, negate what I've said if, after this. But uh, the connection between a person like Rex and music is direct. It's like we're saying, it goes directly from the musical instrument to the mechanical device that sounds like that. And of course, it goes <laughs> See all the fingers work for the right notes? So you have to, the trumpet does not work by practicing lip slurs, okay? Now, we practice those things we call lip slurs, but that's not the real purpose of it. The real purpose is to train your ear, okay, so it's so sharp that your body responds to your ear, okay? And when that happens, like, say, if I take my trumpet, uh, okay, there it is, a mouthpiece. A little sharp. <laughs> See, so what I hear, you can almost immediately play. Eventually. If that's the way you practice. Yes. If you practice going. You're just trying to hit notes, and your body isn't lined up with the sound. Because, the, you know, like when you're walking, you know, it's that old thing about people talking, well, how many muscles does it take to walk? Well, we don't want to know how many muscles it takes to walk, because then we'd fall down. You just, you walk, and you learn to walk, and, and you, you, you're not, you're not thinking about your feet. You're, you're thinking about not running into anything. See? The path, okay, so that this is working because you've learned to, to drive it. You're a good driver. So you can have the greatest machine, but if you, if you don't know where you're going, well, it's pretty hard to hit the right notes. And another thing is, you know, uh, in terms of the sound, we talked, to, we, were, we were getting a little off of where the conductor, you know, the conductor gives you the sign and you play Mahler 5, or you're getting ready to play uh, Most of them you know that, the Song of the Nightingale? Okay, you played You know, it's, it's really, also that's, if you want to hear the greatest triplets ever played, Ever. Listen to Herseth playing the Song of the Nightingale with the Chicago Symphony. Da, 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 da,
what's he playing? And I went, oh my God, it's perfectly rhythmic triplets. <laughs> what have I been playing all these years, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, because he, 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 like Phil said, you hear him counting? Now trust me, when he's playing, do you think he's doing that? You better believe he is. Every time, I still count to this day to make sure, and I don't do it the whole piece, you know what I mean, but I make sure that I've got the, my, I'm lined up with the right. I did that, my band director, I, I, I think that's another important aspect of it, is having somebody to insist that you do this. Do we know this stuff? No. I didn't know any of this stuff. I just, all I knew was my band director would say, oh, you know, you sound pretty good on that. Let's hear you play this. And then he would say, gee, that doesn't sound very good. And you know what he would do next? He would leave the room because he knew that that was not acceptable to me. So he had my number, this guy. So I learned like the whole, everything he ever showed me in the Arben book, I learned it because he told me basically I couldn't, couldn't play it. He was a really wonderful man. I think of him every day. And I know a lot of you have people like that. That's why you're here. You have a lot of people like that in your lives who help you and encourage you and tell you when things don't sound very good, you know, as well. So make sure you really, I'm going to go over a list of things at the very end of things that we all need to do. I do, I try to do every day and every week uh, if it's a weekly event. Um, so so uh, this thing, this discipline, this thing of practicing, you know, uh, getting the sound, we've talked about the sound, you know, you can practice all the lip slurring and things you want, but the sound, and I have a word for that. I don't call it like the slurs or anything like that. I call it tone line. So when the conductor is listening to you, they're really not listening to you playing in rhythm, in time, in tune, and things like that, with the right articulations, right, the right dynamic. All those things are, yeah, they're essential. But, but if it doesn't sound like it's in the same voice, you see, then it becomes next, as far as your audition goes. And I, I have to say, too, that I've taken one audition in my life. The one I auditioned for University of Kentucky in 1972. But yet, a lot of my students have auditioned and been very successful. You know, and, and I know Phil's have too, and you know, and, and, and Rex and everybody else, that, the teachers here, they, because they, they stress not only the fundamentals, but the basic musical thing that has to be there. He, Phil, that's all he talked about, wasn't it? He was talking about who was playing and, and what was next and how loud to play and what, whether rhythm is important. You know, and this, I mean, that's, that's some serious concentration. And you do that all the time. I mean, that's, that's amazing. You know, I think it's amazing. So you take uh, a Phil Smith and a Rex Richardson and their weekly schedule, can they practice all the music that they have to play every week. No, you'd be too tired to play. You, you'd, be, you'd be practiced out, you know. So you have to have the fundamentals really is the main thing that you practice. You're upgrading the level of what you can do on your instrument, from the musical instrument to the mechanical device. The relationship, what, vocally, that makes the connection, that makes the body able to do this. And you can use any methodology you want. I'm not a big fan of any specific, you know, like, you have to play this method or you won't be able to play the trumpet, you won't be a good musician, you know, you're not going to be able to play, or whatever. There, every teacher, I don't think I've ever heard anything, you know, by any really fine teacher that I didn't agree with in some way or another. You know, so don't worry about that stuff. You, you, really, you really have to, be, so basically we have short-term goals and long-term goal, goals in practicing. So we, we're ta still talking about practicing really. So the, 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 the short-term goals are I have to play uh, Tony Plogue's 
concerto number three. Now he might have that particular piece. He might have started a little early on that, because it's it was, it's very challenging and has uh, uncharacter not uncharacteristic but a little more challenging intervallic structure. So he's going to have to practice the hearing part of that. He's not practicing whether he can play from A sharp to B. Okay, <laughs> that's not that, he's not going to be practicing that. He's trying to put all this sound together and make shapes that make music that make an emotional connection with the audience, which I thought was spectacular last night, wasn't it? Rex, that was great. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm lucky because I get to conduct Rex doing that in about a month. And when we finish the performance, my lip is going to feel great. <laughs> I'm so excited about that. But uh, I, think, I think it's really important to, you know, so in other words, let's, let's just take an example, a piece like that, I would probably, if I got it in time, which we never get them in time, uh, new pieces, <laughs> it seems like three weeks before they call and say, well, I should have it ready soon, get it to be really soon, I need to look at it, you know, because it's, uh, composers, you know, get a little behind sometimes, so I would start that as soon as I got it. And, and, uh, and, and start working on it. But you, couldn't, you can't work on it solely because the same week he's going to play the Haydn Concerto with such and such a symphony, and then the next week he's going to play the Paulus Double Concerto with the Baton Rouge Symphony. So he's got that piece in his case, you see, but he only can play it a certain amount, and then he's got to go to the rehearsals for this other thing. So, you know, and then he's in the plane. I've seen a couple of ones in the plane with the Harmon mute, trying to work the fingerings and thinking thinking about the relationship between how the instrument works with how the mind's working. So, so that's the first thing you want to establish when you're practicing your Arben exercises and you're practicing Brandt's and you're practicing Schlossberg and all the other books. Any books are good books because they all deal with your what? Your ear. They all deal with the ear. I, I started out, my first instrument, believe it or not, was marimba. And you say, what the heck? Where would you get a marimba? Well, my mom used to be the, the garage sale queen. She would go to garage sales, you know, and pick up things. And she bought a marimba for $15. A Deegan marimba for $15. A very expensive marimba. And it was one of these portable ones. So I had to carry this thing, like about 15 blocks, to the piano teacher in the town. In little, we lived in a really little town. I had to carry this thing to the piano teacher and set it up. And then I worked with this piano teacher. And they taught me out of this book called The Pasquale Bona Rhythmic Method. Anybody know that book? Take a look at it sometime. It pretty, goes pretty challenging after about 10 pages. And it's, and it's uh, solfege, a little combination of solfege. And uh, right away, you start doing some serious rhythm stuff. And every time I, I, my hand he used to hit me with this ruler, right, you know, like, poof. If I played the marimba, that was rough. So I, I stayed with that for a while. And then I decided that the marimba and me were not friends because I didn't like going to the piano teacher. So, uh, but, but, you know, uh, I think it's really, really important to, to, to listen to yourself, listen to what you hear. You have to be able to hear. He helped me with that method to hear. So I started out by hearing. As far as playing goes, I, I really believe it's good to learn to play by ear. Okay? You know, why do Suzuki students sound really good? Because they don't have anything to do except listen. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of fl Suzuki flute now. There's Suzuki, a lot of different trumpet classes, you know, that, that deal with... Uh, we started without you, Danny. Oh, we're doing great. But, uh, but so, so uh, learning by ear is really, really important. And really, that's what I just did, right? I was just an extension of ear training. I heard it in my head. And then, of course, I've been playing this thing for 50 years. So I should be able to come close to getting the right notes. You don't have to get the right pitch. You don't have to have perfect pitch or something. Don't worry about that. Uh, if, I play, if I play this trumpet, this trumpet, and a piccolo trumpet in A, and an E-flat trumpet, all within the next 15 minutes, I, I couldn't tell what note was. I, I'd have a hard time figuring out what horn I had in my hand. You know, so don't worry about that. You know. But just once you have a, a trumpet in your hand and you have one note, 
so uh, that's why I learned to play jazz. I used to have a terrible time playing classical music. Terrible. Because when I played classical music, I became a note reader. I was a very, very quick note re reader. I was a really bad musical trumpet player when I note read. Because I wasn't playing, the, I wasn't using my body to play what I saw. You cannot play what you see. You can only play what you hear. So when you look at music, when you're practicing, I don't care if it's the F scale and it's written down. Make sure you're hearing. There's no such thing as an F. There's only a pitch that's represented by that particular whatever value note you see on the page. Da. So if we have a... Here, when I see the F scale. So I don't see F, G, A, B flat, C. I have to think about it to name the notes because I don't think that way. I just look at it and it makes sense pitch wise to me. So, what does that do for your body? That aligns it, doesn't it? That puts it in line. A lot of people uh, uh, say that breathing is the main problem, and I, I tend to agree with that. Except, you can breathe all you want, and if you don't hear, you're not going to get that note anyway, and, and it's going to sound tight or loose or, or this or, or something like that. You're going to have all those things happening. That's why all methodologies work, because basically we're all saying the same thing. But if your ear stinks, or you, don't, or you choose not to use it like I did when I played classical music when I was younger, I mean, I couldn't even come in and go, da, 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 da. I couldn't do that. I would just go, okay, C, C. Because I wasn't ready to play any note, let alone C, you know? So basically, I, I wanted to make sure that if I hear it, then I know how to breathe and, and get the notes, get the right sound, get the right pitch in your ear. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? Because really, that's essential. So let's go back to practicing again. So what do you practice? Um, first of all, you practice listening. That was a big implication uh, that Phil, Phil made. Uh, he, a matter of fact, he said it over and over again about listening to this, listening to that, and I, I agree 100%. Um, when I started, I only had four recordings. I, wasn't, I didn't have really enough money to have any more than four recordings. And I had a, we had a stereo set, you know, one of those things that was like a big piece of furniture. And it had a turntable in it. And it came with a record that said, Introducing stereo. It was great. And I remember the recording had Lieutenant Kiji on it. And I put that on, and I said, My, I, man, I love this. this. I really like the way this feels and sounds. So I learned to play. I didn't, I didn't play the trumpet part. I just played the whole, the whole thing. I just, you know, practiced it because I liked the way it sounded. So, so I played along with it. So, Listening before you practice is much more important than practicing. Because otherwise, what are you doing? You're not loading the musical instrument with anything. And if you're starting very much at the beginning and there's not a lot of files in there that you've acquired, it's pretty hard to make the right sound on a trumpet. And uh, I, I mean, like, I've heard uh, players that, like the Suzuki, we talk going back to that, that have played Suzuki violin. I heard the, as a matter of fact, I heard Suzuki, Suzuki came to Eastman uh, about, oh, I don't know, in late 60s, early 70s, with first trip to the US, and he had a, uh, a little girl. I mean, she must have been this tall, I swear. And she had a cello. And she sat down and played the cello, and the whole audience cried. The whole audience cried, because it was something that nobody had ever heard before. And, I, and, and that person, I know they couldn't read any music. They didn't know anything about, you know, anything except what they heard. And that's when I started to realize that, hey, this has got to be the way to learn. <laughs> this is, I want to learn that way. So I just pick up my trumpet and sound like that, you know. So I started to really think about this hearing thing. A lot of teachers, uh, how many pe uh, teachers practice, uh, have, have your students practice patterns with numbers and stuff? 
Some people do that. You know, like uh, singing numbers one, three, five and stuff, and one, two, four, five, or something like that. Any kind of pattern. And then they also have their fingerings. It's also, you know, when you, when you learn to play this way, do you ever really transpose? No. Now, are there any tuba players in here? Good. Uh, <laughs> if tuba players can play three or four different tubas and pick them up and play them without transposing, how come we can't do it? Because they don't do it the same way. They do it by ear. And they, they learn very quickly what the fingerings are for the pitches that they see on that instrument. You see what I mean? So basically, transposing, now those people that have studied with me or know me know that I'm pretty mean with the transposition stuff. You do it from your very first lesson. And, and it's mainly not to be mean. It's meant to be, to start you, to get you to learn to use your ear and not use. So if you're transposing, so if you're doing, so if you're playing like, right? What's the difference? E flat trumpet. That's the right fingerings for, for E flat, right? Okay, what would we do for any trumpet? It doesn't matter. Because, first of all, you've got to know going from the ear to what you need to know. You can practice, you need to practice so your technique is basically pretty flawless. We still make errors, but I mean, you know where every note is all the time. Arpeggios, scales. I do all, I practice all kinds of patterns. Make up a pattern, and then just practice it in all the keys. How many people practice their scales starting on the root? Raise your hands. Almost everybody practices their scale starting on the roots. How much of the music do you play does the music start on the root? Maybe 10%, maybe if you're lucky, you know? Yeah, so basically, well, I, I uh, start practicing my scales uh, from different notes. So like for instance, let's see, uh, let's play C harmonic minor, okay? <laughs> Right? That's C harmonic minor. Doesn't sound like C harmonic minor, does it? Because we've never heard it that way. We've never practiced it that way. So I st every day, I, I, I don't play a lot of scales. I mean, well, I, I do play a lot of scales, but, but I don't play, uh, I play a lot of different ones. So I might take that pattern and then I'll try to play it on. I go, oh my God, I I've never moved my finger like that before. There's a reason you haven't practiced that before. That's why you can't play it, you know? How many people practice their scales? Uh, let's pick a scale. Uh, you pick a note. Oh, he's a mean. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I can play that one that high. I'll see if I can. I'll try anything. Okay. Five notes to the beat. Okay. And that's okay, but I'd have to practice that a little bit to be really good at it. I wouldn't want to play it with this mouthpiece either, my tiny mouthpiece. Uh, I practice, I actually warm up on my small mouthpiece so that I don't let my lips go crazy in there. You know, I just get a really kind of, not tight, just one that has a, a real energetic air column. But so, so practicing notes, uh, things, five notes to the beat. So when you have to play loose soir de soldat, you've actually practiced the F scale five notes to the beat. And you'd be surprised. You know, it's, it's really not that hard. It, that's about the speed. You know how I know how to play that piece? That's as fast as I can single tongue. So that's as fast as the piece goes. <laughs> but there's ways to do it. What are some of the other ones? 
カタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタカタ Is primary to everything. So,、uh, the next thing that I'm working on now, which I know is going to delight all of you, is I'm working on an academic component to your lessons that you have to take tests on and stuff. You're going to hate it. It's going to be great. Okay, it's really, you know, like, like knowing some theoretical things about pieces you're studying, knowing history things, knowing, knowing maybe 500 recordings. That's not too many. You know? I, I don't know how many recordings I have. How many people bought the Phil Smith CD out there? d o n I bought two of them. I, I, I just, just in case I lose one. I mean, yeah, and his first excerpt record? How many people have his first excerpt record? Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, I, I don't even play in an orchestra. You know, that's, that's, that's an, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. Um, I have a fair amount of people come to take lessons from me. You know, sometimes they're auditioning for orchestras and stuff. And,、uh, and I'm not, I, I don't purport to be an orchestra player at all. I, I used to practice that stuff a lot. Okay, and they come and they play this stuff. And I say, okay, well, we're going to, oh, you have to do the second trumpet part, the Bartok and Chair of Orchestra? Okay, okay, let's go. Okay, so I go. So I let them play, and then I go. I play the first part in between. And some people are surprised that I know that. I don't have the music. The ear's working. And many, many, many times did I play that in the practice room. I played it with a few orchestras and stuff like that. So, so I mean, and, and then, I,、uh, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, like they might even be doing Petrushka or something like that. I say, look. You've got to do this better than me. I don't even practice this stuff. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's, that's, that's, and, and Phil really was talking about that too. He was talking about that. How, how prepared you have to be. You have to be really prepared. You know, the details. It's not what you play in an audition that matters, it's what you do and others don't do. It's the detail, the, the, the unbelievable detail that you put into the music. You can call that musicianship, you can call it articulation, you can call it anything you want. But when you can command somebody's attention by your attention to detail, people pay attention to you. They do. You've, you've been there, right? Everybody in this room has heard those performances. They go, oh my God, I never thought of that. I didn't know that note was short. Or, oh boy, that's, oh, that was, what a nice shape that was. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. See what I mean? You know, why am I telling you this? Because you already know this stuff. That's, that's really important. Most of the people in here are experienced. They've practiced hard, they've listened, they've done those things. But sometimes in the act of practicing, we what? We zone out. We're not using all the information. You know, you have to step back from the music stand. Relax. Be objective. you know. I, and、uh, anybody who's ever taken a lesson from me knows, like I said in the beginning, that I, I really never answer any questions at all. I kind of just ask questions. Well, why did you do that? Well, you know, what, what did you do? What, why did you do that? Well, I don't know. I, we played it in band yesterday, and that's why I played it. I'm going, Okay, is that a really good reason to do that? Based on your knowledge, based on your knowledge of music. I said, I happen to know that you know more about music than that. So let's do it again, okay? And usually, you know, so basically when you come to a lesson, the questions, in my case, I know that I ask are not, they're the questions that I ask me when I stop. So, in other words, it's, it's a catalytic, hopefully a catalytic experience. What you do 
in a practice room, the other 20 hours a week, that's what really matters. What you do in a lesson with me, that's one hour. You know, if the only thinking that's going on is the one hour that you're studying with me, let's say it takes uh, five years to get really, really good if you do the, think, the, the true thinking method, right? How many years does it take to do the non-thinking method? 100, right? 20 times 5 is 100. So unfortunately, most of us will not be around to celebrate the fruits of this practice, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So basically, the thought process that you experience in the studio, uh, I want to make sure I'm not going over the time, because I'm really bad at the time thing. So let's see, Rex, you can go doot, 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 when it's 5 till, all right? What you, what'd you say? <laughs> okay, but you know, so, so basically, when you're with your teacher, uh, I'm gonna go over a list of things to do, but when you're with your teacher, one of the things that I tell everybody, and it's in this list, is believe your teacher and other teachers. Listen to what they say. The reason you went to school there or study with that person in whatever town you're in is because you want help, right? You want to get better. So basically, you have to buy into what they're selling. You have to buy into it, try it, use it. What's the worst thing you can say? You know, you come into your first lesson with Rex, and uh, Rex goes, uh, well, you know, what you really need to do is you need to let the air flow a little more. And you stop and you go, well, you know, my teacher said such and such. Now, what does that, now let's translate into what Rex is hearing. He doesn't believe this. I don't believe you. My teacher didn't ever said that. I don't believe you. So right away, what have you done? You put up this wall that's going to be hard to, you know, it's going to be hard to break down. You say, I will definitely try that. And you buy it and you do it. You know, whatever they say, do it. Because you're going to go on this, you're going on a different route, aren't you? That's what you're looking for. You know, you've, you've, you've reached this place that's got the big stone wall, and you're trying to find the way around this wall, and you're saying, no, 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 I'm just going to keep hitting my head on this wall, and eventually this wall is going to fall down. <laughs> no, it's not. You're just going to get a sore head, right, and be frustrated and upset and Maybe even quit, you know, and that's the last thing I want to see for anybody. I just love people practicing trumpet. So listen to your teacher and listen to their questions and their advice and put it into your head and use it all week. The greatest student, I have to say the greatest, I, I, I usually don't say this, but the greatest student I ever had was a person who was going to quit trumpet. Okay, they would they decide they were going to give up the trumpet because it was too hard. I didn't know that, okay? So they came into their first lesson. They said, you know, I'm having trouble with this characteristic study, and I can't even play through the characteristic study. And, you know, I just, I have terrible endurance. So, you know, I'd really, I'd really like you to help me with that. So I, I said, well, I don't know, I'd, I'd try this, and, you know, and you this, breathe, this and breathing this, and uh, try this, and... You know, so you're, you seem to move around a lot, whatever. Well, the next week, the person came back, and I, they actually did all the stuff I told them. And I had never had a student like that. <laughs> you know? I was saying, wow, this person actually did all that stuff. And he said, and also, uh, when I did that, I noticed these things. Now I'm really, I mean, wow. Wow. Yeah. Boy, that's, that's, really, that's really great. Okay, well, let's talk about that. So we talked about that, you know, and had a few more assignments. He asked some more questions. Well, we did this for six weeks because Eastman was only six weeks long in the summer. It was a summer, summer student, you know. And at the end of this six weeks, I was packing up my gear, getting ready to go home, go back to Kentucky. I was real excited. Wow, wow. The Eastman doors are like these vault doors. You know, they're wooden 
they're like, I don't know how many, they're, they're almost 100 years old now, some of them. So the door opens, and this person comes in. And they said, uh, well, you know, I just wanted to thank you for the lessons this summer. You know, they, they were very, very good. And, and uh, I think that now I can go on and play trumpet. I said, well, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm clueless. He says, well, this, this was going to be my last summer on trumpet. This was going to be my last try at this. And that person is the second trumpet of the Chicago Symphony now. Okay? He taught me how to be a good student that summer. I'm just telling you that. I learned how to be a good student studying with him. Because he was the best student. John Hagstrom, most, a lot of you know him. You see him in the magazines. <laughs> John is the greatest person in the world. No one has ever studied anything, I don't, not only trumpet, more completely than this guy has. And I've been a different person since I've known him. I have to tell you that. Because, you know, you realize, and, and another person like that really is Doc Severinsen. Doc Severinsen's the same. He's a person who studies all the time. They never stop studying. Doc is still studying. It's very humbling for us who know we haven't never been that way our whole lives. I want you to think about that. You know what's the great part? You can be from Danville, Kentucky like me. You got to remember, I've spent my whole career in Kentucky. I haven't lived in New York City. You know, I haven't been in, in the Chicago Symphony or any other symphony really, except for Cincinnati Pops, which I've done a lot of nice things with. I've been lucky to do that. And, and uh, so it, it's an accident then, right, that somebody gets good? No, it's never an accident. It's, it's a tremendous discipline. And uh, does anybody know where, uh, uh, let's see, Judy LeClaire is from. Anybody know where she's from? She's a bassoonist. She's from Vienna. West Virginia. Does anybody know what her position is? Principal bassoon in the New York Philharmonic. There's a street light in Vienna, West Virginia. <laughs> she lived there an awful long time. See what I'm saying? Isn't that exciting? That's, that's the excitement for me, is knowing that I can get better no matter where I live. I come to something like this. I'll tell you, I come to these things I leave really excited about practicing, even more than I do now. So practicing, let's talk about a couple of things here. And uh, anybody have any questions about that? Yes? Um, when you said, uh, like, think about every note, think about, like, make sure you're always thinking, how do you not get in the way of yourself when you're playing yourself to do something? What are you thinking about? Uh, See what I mean? Vince is thinking about simple things. I, 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 I'm a pretty simple guy. If it isn't easy, Vince can't do it, okay? <laughs> I, I mean, I can't be balanced, and I, you know, I'm not one of these guys that can juggle things and play the trumpet at the same time. No, I'm thinking about what it's supposed to sound like. In the pra when I'm practicing, I'm practicing that. I'm practicing the finished product, even if I'm just going dee, 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 dee. That has to relate to something that you're going to use in music. The Timothy Dockshutzer said something very important. You can practice, you can't, you can't practice technique without practicing music. You can't practice music without practicing technique. So all the time there's this balancing act going on that we're doing, at least in the, in the practice room, okay? Until the point comes where we feel where our confidence, and Phil talked about confidence, which was really great. Confidence is because you're pretty sure you know what you're doing. What happens when you go out on stage and you go, I hope I can get this. He even said, he didn't use the word hope, but he, he said, he, he implied that, and he says, that's just not, a, it's good to be hopeful about things and have hope, but hope doesn't have a really great place in trumpet playing or any musical play. You can hope all you want, and it's not going to come out. You know what I mean? Sometimes if, you know, you have to just think about what the product is, what's the sound you're trying to get. 
you know, I, I thought that one day my lip would be like steel. I'd never get tired. You know, I'd wake up, my lip would feel wonderful. But it was like a, you know, it was like Twilight Zone. I'd wake up every morning. What a terrible day that was yesterday. My lip feels like somebody walked on it, you know. And, you know, it's gotten better because my, my practice habits have gotten better, but that's all. Let me read this short list to you because I think it's really helpful for your practicing. And we've talked a little bit about practicing. Um, so when you do something like this master class, what good is it? You have to say, well, what have I learned? You know what I mean? Uh, what's going to be different? Did this do anything that's going to make me think differently, act differently? be a little different in terms of my approach to practicing, okay? Um, and then I have a list of 15 things. Some of them, almost, they're exact duplicates of what Phil said. They're all written on my little, my little list here. And uh, one of them, the first one, uh, they're not in any particular order, really, but the first one is to be considerate. That's what's that got to do with practicing? Well. You need to put people at ease, all the people around you. You know, sometimes it's easy to what? To make people feel uncomfortable. Some people make a habit of it, trying to make people feel uncomfortable. So don't be one of those people. Try to make people feel good about what they're doing. Uh, be progressive. We've implied that. In other words, if I just keep doing it the same way wrong, eventually it'll be right. No, that's not going to work. You have to try little things. You have to use some sort of a, you know, method, thought process that's going to change that, okay? Uh, be respectful. It's really important that you, when you work with people, that you have a great respect for what they're doing, whether it's a different music or a different style of playing, you know, or, or whatever. And also, assimilate it into your body so you know what that sounds like, because that's part of your files. It's expanding your knowledge, okay? And you do that by, and you're also respectful just in general as a person. That's important. Uh, I said it before, believe your teachers and other teachers. We're all teachers. Like I said, I learn, I learn from every student. You all, that I've, every person I've ever taught has taught me. I've learned from, from you. And I, and I try to put that incorporated into my, my own practice and to other students' practice, okay? So I do that. Uh, listen and then practice. I think that's really important. So have a model of what you're trying to do, at least a, a general environmental kind of thing. Music is environmental. So, you know, if you only have the melody line and you know that and you don't have the environment that goes with it, that's what Phil was talking about when he was talking about Petrushka. Okay? Try something new every day. Duh, right? Yeah, try something. Look, at, look, look a page further in your book. Wow, what's that rhythm? Let me try to figure that out on myself, on my own, without somebody telling me what it is. Okay? Uh, be an asset to your community. Boy, that's, that's a really important one. Because you're going to be around a lot of people. And there's, if you have a special talent or a skill, or if there's something that you can do, make sure you help other people do that in a way that's not in, intrusive. You know what I mean? In a way that, that, that's going to be, you make, of course, you're being a friend with this person, with these other things anyway. All these things become very easy. And you know what happens? They reciprocate. Isn't that great? I think it's great. Okay. Now, this sounds like it would be a, a, a gimme, right? Enjoy music every day. How many people get down into the dark cellars of music? They walk with the dark cloud around. I mean, we had Eastman. I'm surprised that ever, there was ever sun around Eastman School of Music building. It was lots of darkness there. Well, no, that, this is worse than Rochester. This was the Eastman School of Music darkness. The people had all clouds around their heads, and were, not all of them, but many of them did. Okay, time. Okay, I'm going to finish quickly. Be curious. You know, make sure you're open to do that. That's what you were when you walked in here. What's this nutty trumpet player going to do? You know what I mean? That's, that's curious. 
Be disciplined. That's what comes after curious. You gotta, you gotta practice that. Be friendly. That's so simple, isn't it? Yeah. Be happy. Oh my gosh. We don't want to have, every, oh, have a lot of happy people around. That'd be awful. Be positive, even in light of, of failures. Be positive. Don't be afraid of failing. Almost every person I know that's been successful says, don't be afraid of failing. Because failure brings on much more positive things. Because you can eliminate at least the thought of that and going a different direction. Adapt. Phil, he said that word. Do you notice he said adapt? That's a really important word. Because people are going to be talking to you about how to do things, when to do things, etc. And you have to be willing to be flexible about what, what you're doing. It's not always your way or the highway. Okay? Or you'll be the only one on the road. Okay? And of course the last one is be humble. Because no matter how well you play or what you can do that no one else can do, that's no reason to think you're different than anyone else. There are so many things that I cannot do. You know? And I'm still practicing a lot of those things on trumpet and I'm still practicing some of these basic fundamental things to make sure I do those on a daily basis. It isn't easy to do all these things because we're human beings. We're not perfect. And of course, remember the most important thing of all, that extraordinary is not genius. There are very few geniuses in the world. Extraordinary, what is extraordinary? I happen to be extraordinary. And I'll show you how. In a room, when I'm in a room with people, that's me. <laughs> I'm usually the shortest one. Okay? No, you're shorter. Yeah, okay, I'll, I want you in the room with me next time, so I'm not the shortest. Okay. Uh, yeah, so when you think about extraordinary, you, most people are thinking about all these skills and this, all this stuff, but it's simpler than that. If you're out of the ordinary, that means in trumpet talk, and in trumpet world and practicing, that means that you have worked to the nth degree, like a Doc Severinsen, like a Rex Richardson, okay? Like a Phil Smith. Do you know what it's like to do what he's just done in the last three years? You don't want to know. I don't even want to know. It's extraordinary. And, and I'll tell you, at 67, every day, I get up and I go, okay, let's see what it's going to be like today, you know? <laughs> but I'm not afraid of that. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to find a way to do the max of what I can do. And that's where you get your satisfaction. If you don't practice to the nth degree, if you're not extraordinary, you should not expect great results. Isn't that awful? That's an awful thing to say. But it's true, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm not saying you have to practice seven hours a day. That's stupid. Don't do that. Have fun. But if you've practiced as many hours as you want to, as many as you can, you know, as many as you need to that day, that's a great day. See what I mean? So it's not like this all or nothing thing. And you have to have a wonderful life with your family and, and your friends because that all contributes to wonderful, wonderful music. It makes you understand what? What music is. Music isn't playing the, uh, the Hummel trumpet, the trumpet Concerto or the Hindemith. Music is something that when you play for the audience, they feel the emotion. Isn't that where we started today? Yeah, we started with emotion. And we, we've, run a, we've run a full circle and brought it through some things that are going to help us be more emotional and be more effective as musicians. And really, that's what this competition is about. You hear things. Sometimes they're, you don't know why people sound so good or whatever, but it's pretty related to this stuff. Any last questions before we get kicked out of the hall? Well, listen, this has been wonderful. This is my I, I think you can tell that I love teaching. And every person that is invited to NTC are people who love trumpet, love to teach, and love to hear young people do well. So thank you for coming and being great musicians. Thank you. Thank you.